Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, talk about duct tape, bubblegum, and bailing wire, and the 12 steps in operating open, open stack. Before we get started, I just wanted to film, familiarize uh, everyone with the analogy about what a duct tape, bubblegum, and bailing wire fix is. So as you can see on this opening slide, there's a, there's a bit of duct tape applied to an airplane wing. Um, it's, not, it's not something that you'd really like to see if you were getting on a plane, getting ready to fly across the Pacific Ocean. But evidently, it's an important fix, and it's an important fix that uh, needed to be made, and it works, and it gets something done. It's, it's a fix that probably the guy's not too proud of, but uh, it's, it's something that's need to, to function. And so as we get into our talk today, um, we're going we're gonna to kind of set some ground rules. The, the first part's going to be we're going to talk about these 12 steps that we kind of adopt. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the different things, the different fixes that we use to keep OpenStack up and running. Um, and then the second half, we're going to have kind of open the floor. And we're going to look for audience participation. Uh, I'm sure as we get through this talk, there's a lot of things that are going to kind of come to mind. And so I encourage you, if something strikes a nerve, to, to come on up at the end of this and share your strange and interesting fixes. So with all that being said, um, we're going to first go for the, the 12 steps, the kind of the ground rules. You notice um, we've got just our first names up here. I'm Eric. This is Matt, Mike, and Chris. We don't have any company affiliation right now. We're trying to create a safe place <laughs> where we can all admit to uh, these things that we do. We don't want don't to have shame for any of these things that we do. So with that, the first step of our 12-step program is we admitted we are powerless over upstream, that our lives have become unmanageable. If you're an operator, this is, this is very familiar. This probably looks like a few of our desks, I think, maybe. The, the next step, and this is kind of why we're here, uh, we've, we've come to this belief that an ATC greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So this kind of speaks to us getting involved with this community trying to share feedback with the development teams, with the cores, with the ATCs, the PTLs, um, and try to kind of shape the future of OpenStack and kind of fix some of these problems that, that we run into every day. The next step here is we've made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of community involvement. So that's the, the third step in our process. You can see that uh, that looks like one of us at our desk um, after going through an incident. The next step, this is especially important for operators, is to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of all of our hardware. So you can see, uh, if, if any of you guys work with data center operation kind of guys, this is, this is where we like to hang out and make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. The next step in our 12-step program, we admit to upstream, ourselves, and our customers the exact nature of our wrongs. Uh, sometimes this is pretty obvious what our wrongs are when, when things don't go well, but it's important for us to be honest that uh, things don't go correctly. The sixth step in, a, in our 12-step program is we're entirely ready to have upstream remove all these defects of character. Once again, this is part of why we're here to, this week, to get involved, to try to help shape the future of what OpenStack is going to be. The seventh step is we humbly humbly ask upstream to remove our shortcomings. The eighth item is we make a list of all of our customers we have harmed and be willing to make amends to them all. Sometimes that list can get kind of big, sometimes when things don't go well. That's, that, that's, a, that's a phone book, yeah. If, if Neutron doesn't, if Rabbit goes poorly, that's, that's the list of customers right there. Uh, we make direct amends to our customers wherever possible, except when to do so would, would harm them or injure others, or their VMs, or their tenant networking, or their storage, or any other thing that can go wrong and, and usually does. The tenth step is we continue to take inventory that we were, where we were wrong and promptly admit it, try to fix the things that, that we know we are, we're broken with. The 11th step, sought through code review and bribery, which probably happened this week, probably, you know, at parties or whatever, to improve our conscious contact with upstream as we understood it, praying only for the integration test to pass 
and for the power to plus two and merge things. Yeah, we'd like to not have to hit recheck on, on changes. And the twelfth and final step is, having had a spiritual awakening of the results of these steps, we try to carry this message to other operators and practice these, these principles in all of our affairs. So those are the 12 steps of being an OpenStack operator that we kind of start with to lay the groundwork and set the environment for um, how, how we're going to kind of hold our meeting here. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Matt for, to get into the meat of things. Thanks, Eric. So now that Eric's defined the 12 steps, it's time for us to come together to make amends, to admit our shortcomings. It's time to talk through the duct tape we use to tie things together, the bubble gum we patch holes with, and the bailing wire we use to mine OpenStack to our infrastructure. I'm going to start going through a few of these now. The first thing we all need to admit is that we all have shameful cron jobs that we run to keep OpenStack running. Um, Glance cache cleaner and pruner, um, our hard drives were too small and Glance kept filling them up. So we run Glance Cache Cleaner and Pruner every minute on the minute to ensure that <laughs> Glance can't ever fill the hard drive. <laughs> the second one is a Neutron health check, in quotations, um, basically to prevent L3 agent problems every so often just restart everything. Keeps Neutron happier. Horizon session cleanup. Uh, for a while, any time the load balancer checked Horizon, which is a lot, and we have a lot of load balancers, it started putting stuff in the database, and eventually the database fills up. So instead of fixing the problem, we just have a cron job to uh, drop everything out of the database for Horizon sessions. Uh, finally, we have a open source time series database that's not super stable. So we have a 20-minute staggered cron job to restart it on every node in the cluster, one by one. <laughs> so that the cluster stays up and running. And hopefully, while we're going through this, you guys can think of some of these things that you can come share with us at the end. OK, just restart it. We all admit um, this is a solution to problems, especially if uh, Google doesn't give us a better answer. So you know, does Glance seem slow today? We probably just ought to restart it. Um, hey. 20 of our Nova Compute checks just blew up in Isinga. They turned red. We should probably just restart it. I think Rabbit just died. We should probably restart everything. <laughs> and we have tools to do this, and I know other people do too. And this is not Ice House stuff. This is stuff we do in Kilo. Everything listed are things we still do in Kilo. Before we knew better, we've all learned a lot over the past few years in OpenStack. Um, originally, if we had a problem with the floating IP, we'd restart OVS. Turns out this isn't always the best solution, um, especially when you have a lot of uh, routers on a box. It takes forever to get the flows back, and you have everyone unhappy instead of one person unhappy. In our early days, if Rabbit seemed weird, we would just bounce that. And especially before heartbeat support, nothing really like that. And that kind of goes back to the earlier slide. This last one's one of my favorites. Uh, we ordered a bunch of hardware, uh, showed up, got racked in the data center, and then we found out it couldn't boot the OS we wanted. So, <laughs> OK, that's it for my uh, confessions. I'll hand off to Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm a OpenStack operator. Hi, yeah. Mike. <laughs> so let's talk about tooling a little bit. Um, if you've ever done any work on your house or maybe on your car or something like that, you know there's Nothing worse than trying to do a job when you don't have the right tools. Okay, these are some good examples. This guy's my favorite. He's really taken it to the next to the next level. Okay. So, thank you, Google Image Search. Um, but ser seriously, here are some things that we kind of need to do that we don't have the right tools for. Um, re replaying events. So we know that. Events that uh, Nova sends out, or maybe Neutron, sometimes have a tendency to get lost. Uh, the Agents may not be up at that time or something, something times out. Really need a way to be able to replay some of these things and kind of get things back to a better state. And there's really nothing out there that's, um, that lets us do that in a, in a sane way today. Um, cleanup jobs, anybody have scripts to do cleanup? I mean, I know everybody does. Um, 
you know, orphan, orphan VMs, orphan QMU processes, somebody deletes their project out of Keystone, we all know that there's zero automatic cleanup of everything that's owned by that project and you've got to go back and fix all that stuff. Uh, security groups and Neutron is another good example. Um, I think we're all pretty intimately familiar with all the quota problems in Nova and how, you know, that almost always uh, does not represent reality and there are things that we have to do to go reset those and make sure that people can actually deploy VMs when they should be able to even though Nova thinks they're out of quota. Another, a little bit more of an edge case is just kind of this idea of being able to orchestrate things a little better. So one example is um, having to evacuate a compute node, you know, maybe it's got 20, 30, even more VMs running on it and you want to live migrate those all off so you can do some kind of maintenance. Well, you probably don't really want to kick off 40 live migrates at once um, on a compute node. I know that's a, a real example for some folks here. Um, really would like to be able to serialize that stuff, kind of do it one at a time and in a little more better, better controlled fashion. And again, there's just, you know, there's just really nothing out there that allows us to to do those kind of things today. <clears throat> so what do we do? Who has a directory on their production servers that looks like this with a bunch of random scripts? I mean, everybody should have their hands up. This is everybody, right? It's okay, there's no shame. Right, yeah, this, yeah. Um, I mean, li literally this is the uh, roots home directory on one of our production servers, so you can see, I mean, these are things that needed to get done. We just gotta get this thing out the door so we can move on with our life. Um, or even better, I pulled a couple things from our bash history. I like to call these the Rube Goldberg bash one-liners. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, we're, we're, you're not alone, right? Um, you know, so, so we kind of all know how this goes, right? And, you know, we always have this good intention of like, well, when I have some time later this week or whatever, I'll, I'll clean these up a little bit and I'll upstream them so that other people can use them. And we, we actually do have an OpenStack operators project now that's supposed to be for this kind of stuff so that we can stop reinventing the wheel and everybody doing the same things over and over again. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. The short name is just OS Ops. Um, but the reality is you never get there, right? You never have that time because there's always something on fire. There's always something to be fixed. and yeah, I mean, that's just the reality that we kind of have to admit to ourselves. So a couple other kind of fun stories we'll call out here is just kind of unexpected things that happen when you make a change that you don't, um, you're not really planning on, okay? This, this guy probably could have foreseen that coming, but, um, yeah. <laughs> Should we just watch it about five times and then, huh? and then I'll keep going. <laughs> no, uh, so one, one thing we did is we, we turned on config drive, um, uh, force con config drive in Nova to make sure that all VMs get a config drive. We, we use that to apply the networking config to all our VMs, so we wanted to just make sure that was gonna be there globally. So, you know, flip that switch on, should be great, whatever. Well, now it turns out all the VMs that existed before that point that didn't have a config drive, now Nova won't boot them because it can't find the uh, config drive device file on the hypervisor. So that was a fun one. We had to go back and backfill with just blank config drives for everything out there so that we could actually boot all the VMs. And again, one of those things that you just don't, you know, you make some assumptions and you just don't expect to happen and then you've got to deal with it. Kind of a similar thing with serial consoles in Nova as well. We turned that on so we could enable some out of band type of stuff into the VMs. Um, but ran into this strange race condition where if the, the console device had been cleaned up or deleted ahead of time, then Nova wouldn't be able to delete the VM because it would try to delete that device itself. It couldn't find it and it would just fail the whole operation. So, you know, now we've got a pile of stuff that's um, accumulated cruff that we've got to go back to our cleanup scripts and, and go and reap all that stuff. So, you know, just all these crazy things that happen that you don't necessarily think will, uh, will occur. So that's my spiel. I'll hand it over to Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. I've been open. <laughs> Thank you. I've been operating OpenStack for about three years now. So 
Sometimes the problems that we run into is the case that we're doing something that isn't actually supported by the project. So for us, we do layer three networks. Um, we run our network as a folded cloth design. Um, basically, the upshot is we have layer two that only exists at a top of rack, and we have multiple top of racks, and then we have that collection of top of racks, uh, those layer twos. We call that production, or we call it dev, or we call it test. And in our particular network environment, we don't do layer two everywhere. Layer two is constrained to a particular spot. So in certain cases, it's a case of a missing primitive in the project to actually describe what we do. So again, one of the cases is we need to have, for us and quite a few other large operators, we need to have a constrained segmented network which means that this layer two domain is only actually available to these set of hosts because, oh, thank you. <laughs> right. Right. So, <laughs> so for some of us, like I said, any L2 anywhere is not a thing. So this is actually kind of like an anti-neutron anti policy. Um, but the good news is we're working on uh, the large deployment team is working with some neutron cores to actually get a model that supports this type of thing put into neutron. Um, the second thing is once you have this network, you can actually have subnets that you can route within anywhere within that network. So right now, anytime you define a subnet, you have to define a layer two network. That model doesn't quite map to this type of thing because those are just routes, like you just route a subnet. There is no broadcast domain, there is no layer two thing around that. So it also doesn't support layer three routed networks. So there's also another spec that's working on, and hopefully we're trying to get something working between some of our larger deployments to actually get that working, but Neutron itself right now can't support the type of network that we have, so we have a bunch of hacks put in on Neutron and on Nova side to abstract away the network information. So our end users basically aren't aware of kind of what's going on underneath, but uh, it, it creates a fair amount of pain for some of us who have to do this. And sometimes it's, it's really not OpenStack's fault, except for that terrible error message. So who here has seen this error? <laughs> All right, so for the others who haven't, maybe a little bit of learning. Um, we did a kilo upgrade and about two days later, we started seeing this error across all our compute nodes randomly in an environment. It was the second environment that we had upgraded. And basically, it took us two days of troubleshooting, adding code, debugging to figure out what the heck it means. But the upshot is, if you're running Nova Conductor, all the compute agents talk to Nova Conductor for DB access, and that provides the model server. So basically it's saying I tried to talk to Conductor, something happened, and I wasn't able to complete my DB query. The issue ended up being that between Nova Conductor and the database server, we had 12 sets of links. One link was having 20% errors. So if you average that across the entire traffic that was traversing that set of links, it's under 1% of traffic was affected, but it caused impact across our entire environment. And what's even worse, the Nova conductor was logging exactly zero errors about having bad access to the database. So it was successfully recovering, but when model server went away error actually happens, what it really means is that a query took nine seconds to complete from Nova conductor. So more terrible error messages. <laughs> so uh, hands who have seen no valid host found. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying to yourself and you should see step one. Um, there was an entire session dedicated to troubleshooting no valid host found. I think that actually was today. Um, Basically, it happens for a variety of reasons. You could have capacity issues, you could have configuration issues, you can have transient issues inside your cloud. You can have rabbit issues. Filter issues. Filter issues, um, that's, that's actually what the, there are not enough hosts available if you screw up your filters. Um, and you 
don't return any host, then you get that error, which a little more descriptive, but not actually telling you what the problem is. But back to the no valid host found, this is the error that we show our end user. So if you're a public cloud, maybe you don't want to have them seeing all the, the kind of the internals. But if you're an enterprise, you want your users to see it so they can help diagnose kind of what's going on. Because sometimes they can put, uh, maybe they put the wrong tag on a glance image and it no longer matches a host. Or they mistyped it so it's a Windows image, but they misspelled Windows so like they switched two letters and now it no longer goes to the correct host and it doesn't boot right or something like that. Um, we need to be able to have the option to let some of our end users see some of the error messages because right now, no valid host found for all of us ends up being a call or a ticket saying your cloud is broken. So with that, that's our, that's our basic intro. I hope that um, sparked some, some ideas in, in everyone there. So with that, we wanted to kind of open it up and try to gather more feedback, uh, more horror stories, more crazy fixes, more anything that you can think of. Um, so with that, we'd like to kind of open it up. Um, we'd also like to thank everybody for being here and uh, the, the participation that all the operators have uh, with the upstream teams, the acceptance that the upstream teams have for including us, um, and all of that kind of good jazz. So with that, um, I'll leave the 12 steps up here in case anybody needs to refer to anything for the rules. But uh, with that, I'd open it up to the, to the floor. Yeah, and if you want to step up to grab a mic, that'd be great. But if you want to just stand up and can speak loud, that's great too. Yeah, so we have we have situations like that too, where we'll carry a local patch that upstream won't take, or it might just maybe upstream will take it, but it'll just take a long time to go through review and all the tests and everything else in the feedback process. Um, so we have something like that. We will we will mi mirror the Git repos that are upstream, and we've got a tool called Git Upstream, which is also by OpenStack Infra, that'll help us um, kind of carry local patches and check whenever it gets merged upstream then we'll kind of close that patch down and we won't carry it anymore since it's been merged upstream. So we use a tool like that. I don't know about you guys. We maintain our own, uh, our own Git repo and basically we try to follow stable branches so we'll rebase our patches on top of that and build packages directly from Git repos. Yeah, so um, that was one of the things we're working on is trying to get all these local patches that some of us are usually implementing for business logic or to fix something. Um, we had a pretty big list from about 12 or 15 companies and came up with a list of things that we found a bunch of people were actually doing the same thing and trying to assign people to work on getting those actually upstream so pretty much everybody can take advantage of it and working with the PTLs and some cores in those projects to actually try to get get some of this fixed for not only just us so we quit carrying patches but so other people when I tell them like oh yeah we do this one thing and they go like oh I want to do that where's your code and you go okay I'll get something out there somewhere so you guys can have it. Yes, so some of us will, will do that, where we'll have, we'll build our own packages, and as part of building that package, we might inject a, a patch in there as well and carry it that way. I think there's probably a couple of different ways, and some of it kind of depends upon the situation that you're in, I think. We do it both ways. We carry a Git, we put our stuff in a Git repo, or stuff that we take from other members of the community. Uh, people have been willing to share patches with us, we'll carry those as patches on top of a package that get applied by the tool that we use. We use Anvil to build uh, RPM packages. I know one of our like informal rules, at least for, for our group, is we try to make sure that if we're gonna carry this patch, we should at least put it up for review. That doesn't mean that it's gonna get accepted or merged or anything like that, but at least that says we've, we've kind of taken the step to reach out to the community to say like, we think this is needed. 
um, at least kind of put it out there. Hopefully it gets merged and we don't have to carry it anymore and it just becomes a thing, but sometimes it takes a while. That also takes a while to get it backported if it does it all. Right, yep. <laughs> yep. Hi, my name is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> I've been operating OpenStack for, gosh, like five years now, I think, like pretty much since the beginning. Uh, the first one I deployed was Bear from Trunk, uh, so that was a good time. Uh, and a lot of these problems have been fixed, so there is hope. The 12 steps work. Um, <laughs> but to, uh, I have a bunch of stories, so I'll start with one which was almost a disaster but didn't end up being. So we had object storage. We were using object storage to host images, and we had run out of room in our in our object storage cluster and we'd run out of budget to buy more um, and at the time I worked for a company which happened to also have an internet provider business that had uh, set-top boxes in everybody's houses and so they decided that a good idea might be to leverage the extra 80 gig hard drive in all of these set-top boxes <laughs> and create a giant nationwide cluster Kevin, congratulations you win <laughs> Well, fortunately, we shut that down, so that didn't that didn't actually happen. But it wasn't because they didn't think it would be a good idea technologically. They were just afraid of a lawsuit, I think. Um, so that's that's a pretty good one. Um, I can go on, but I'll let somebody else have a chance if anyone else wants to talk. The bar is set pretty high right now, so. Back to him. Uh, I came in a little late. I'm not sure how many sees the RPC timeout errors. Nope, that wasn't covered. Okay, so I I can talk of two or three different RPC timeout errors. Um, the the first time it happened, we were all figuring out why it was happening. It resulted in a RabbitMQ clustering broken. And um, if you're seeing Rabbit, uh, RPC timeout errors, rather than looking at anywhere else, the first place I would suggest looking at is to see if your um, Rabbit cluster is working as expected. This is because um, you might be sending message to one of the primary servers, and the listener might be connected to the other one. And if they don't talk to each other, um, this guy would wait for like what three three hundred seconds, I believe, which is the default, and do a timeout. The other one was um, Grizzly. Um, this is this is a little older, but what um, used to our devs swore that. Every time if there is a rabbit um, restart or if there is a connection failure, it would retry. But apparently, NOAA Compute doesn't do that. So our, our, this, this it, it does recently, but like, yeah. yeah. This is, I'm talking yeah, about yeah. Grizzly. So what would happen, uh, or what happened is our playbook said that if you see any clustering issues, just go re, uh, restart rabbit. And it would do two things. It would first wipe off the queue. Our, our script was written to wipe off the queue. This means that every transient message would be lost. And the other thing is subsequent boots, whatever was broken would start working, but the, sub the other machines which are working would break. This is because Rabbit, I mean, the normal computer wouldn't reconnect back um, to the Rabbit. For, for sure, if you restart Rabbit, usually more than two things happen. <laughs> <laughs> what are those and two none things? of them are good. What are those two things? Uh, well, you'll <laughs> usually have to restart everything. Okay, right? okay, yep. I mean, and, and transient data loss. Yeah. If that's what you meant, yep. okay. And this this is the most recent one. Um, again, we saw a connection timeout, um, but Rabbit everything was was working fine. But this resulted uh, th this was prime uh, was a problem in our custom code, uh, which we had overridden um, the Nova network to make our um, custom uh, database calls. And somebody had written a code to to capture socket errors. So basically, we were leaking file descriptors, and we would capture that. If you do an S-trace, you would see that no socket available or unable to open up a new connection, but you are capturing that and throwing a nice error back saying connection timed out. Yeah. Thank you. But, but yeah. not, not the ADGB. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, my name is Wei. I, I'm working uh, for PayPal. So we have uh, we'll operate the the OpenStack Cloud for, I, I think, uh, four years. So I just add something for that Rabbit MQ issues. So we have firewalls between the controller nodes and hypervisors. That makes, makes the Rabbit connection even worse. 
So sometimes the, the f if you have an idle connection, let's say if you don't have messaging set up for a long, very long time, so the, the firewall drops your connection, but, the, but either side doesn't know that, so they still think the connection is, is active. In that case, even you reboot RabbitMQ, it doesn't help because the, the normal computer thinks the connection is still good. So uh, you, it's as if you have to reboot both. Uh, so, the, uh, so currently, we, after we upgrade to Kino, so we, we, we enable the heartbeat. Uh, so far, uh, it, it seems works. Yep, for sure. The, the rabbit heartbeat stuff that was merged recently definitely has helped out a lot of issues, for sure. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Thank you. I've been uh, running OpenStack since 2013. Excuse me. It's been a while. And I want to tell you about one horror story that happened to me. Um, one of our use cases was to run Cassandra on Ceph, on OpenStack. And we deployed Cassandra in a test configuration, small drives. And it worked fine. And then the Cassandra team took over, and they started ramping up the I.O., and all the instances died and fell over and sank into the swamp. And we figured out, finally, after many weeks, that we could get the same behavior by creating very large drives and running, F, uh, and running um, uh, uh, MegaFest on them repeatedly, and sometimes they would die. Going on, trying to figure this out, trying to figure this out. And finally, Red Hat comes back and says, how many file descriptors are you setting for your limit? <laughs> because, of course, Ceph opens a billion TCP sessions, which all require one file descriptor. And so when we did a, a look at the number of threads, we were running about 4,000 threads per KVM process, which is a Ceph library thing. And each thread had an open TCP session to some uh, OSD, because we had a couple of thousand of those. And so that's what happened. And so, you know. Setting limits fixed all the problems and it works great. But uh, man, couldn't figure that out for the longest time. So make sure to set, check your limits. Yes, if you run certainly. Into problems. Yeah, yeah. Know your limits. That's right. <laughs> know your limits. I just wanted to add on top of uh, what he said about Seth. If you want to increase the amount of uh, what was it? You cycle PID in the kernel because oh, when you go into recovery, Seth will like nonstop port processes to you know recover things when you. Processes or threads? Uh, you need to be able to recycle the PID. Right. There's right. a setting for that. Okay. That's the CTL. So, and if you don't do that, you're going to run out of PID, and it's just going to, you know, fail. <laughs> cool. Cool. Which is bad. <laughs> My name is Igor. Hi, Hi Igor. <laughs> And have been running OpenStack Cloud since 2011 at eBay, at PayPal, at Symantec now. So I have quite a few horror stories, but I'm not going to try to share all of them today. So talking about limits, uh, now this is a recent one for us. Uh, anyone here run out of loop devices on the hypervisors? <laughs> loop devices. Uh, um, the default is eight, and uh, if Nova, for whatever reason, uh, failed to release loop device, and that happened to us already a few times, then uh, any new provisioning on that node fails. And because that node at that point is, has the most resources available, it always goes to the same damn node. <laughs> That's so intelligence. We, yeah. <laughs> so we started increasing that uh, kind of on all of our hypervisor from default eight to say sixty four, just to make it a little bit safer. Now, back to uh, connection issues. Uh, glance, uh, I like that one, actually. So. Uh, that one is interesting. Uh, we have uh, database uh, and uh, database cluster fronted by load balancer. 
load balancer, as usual, have uh, long lived connections, and uh, then it drops the connection to the actual database. Glance doesn't know about that. Now it's uh, waiting for, um, say, what? About, I think it's two minutes, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's uh, 10 minutes for that connection to, uh, uh, for that operation to fail before it actually can recover and uh, you, uh, start a new connection. Um, kind of not a problem, but interesting one. So, oh, so one more. Oh, okay. okay. On the connections. Yeah. No, uh, that's not the connection. Keystone. Yeah. That one uh, actually my favorite because I spent on it uh, personally a few d a few nights. Uh, so uh, user complains about uh, latency issue with Keystone. So we go, we check, everything seems to be normal. Keystone runs perfectly fine. Uh, everyone else is uh, have no problems, but uh, this specific user have uh, spikes anywhere between mm, like two to say 15 seconds. And then we try to figure out what happens to that specific user. Well, as we find out, the log, memcached log, before it goes to memcached, it tries to uh, log. And it has this uh, interesting algorithm for the back of It's random. <laughs> zero to one second and 15 retries. So <laughs> <laughs> you, it works itself and it, then you get interestingly anywhere up to 15 seconds delay when you try to, log, uh, to uh, get token in parallel from multiple threads. Mm. Okay, enough I think for today. <laughs> So tacking on to that glance one, um, we've noticed a couple times when we have issues between where glance registry is running and the database in which glance registry talks to you, that sometimes it'll just, after that connection goes away and comes back, it will just throw 500 errors until you restart glance. Th that's the only fix. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anybody else have? Time for one more. Come on, Kevin. I can go again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got so many. Uh, I'll just the one. So I don't know anybody has ever used the Neutron L3 HA tool, quote unquote, that was in Think Stack Virtual. Yeah. So that was actually a hack, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, <laughs> but that was I wrote that. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> That wasn't the one I was going to talk about, though. Um, so we had, this is actually an OVS problem. We had um, a tenant go live, and they effectively wanted to create a CDN in OpenStack. And so they had, but what they did was, again, this is, the, this is a different company that had, they, they needed unmetered IP addresses. So effectively, if you downloaded something from your cell phone, it didn't count against your, your data plans quota. Um, and it took a year to get an IP address unmetered. And so in their infinite wisdom, they got three IP addresses unmetered um, for, a, for a program where they wanted to send out uh, something like 15 million uh, firmware updates to Android phones. And so, um, <laughs> and so they bring up three floating IPs and create three HA proxy instances and proceed to point 15 million I, uh, <laughs> cell phones at these three addresses. And now this was OVS 1, like 10, I think it was. And so it had actually a hard-coded um, flow limit of like 2,000. And so now, as you probably know, L L3, you know, every individual port and, and IP unique one creates a new flow. So, you know, the first wave of people hit it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The L L3 agent just falls over. We're like, holy shit, how are we going to, like, what are we going to do with this thing? Um, so so, we, so we, what we end up having to do, it's like thrashing the CPU is pegged. And also, it wasn't multi-threaded in its flow management either at that point. OVS wasn't. So it's like CPU is pegged at 100 on one core. Um, and... Uh, so we, what we ended up having to do, to make the long story short, was we ended up having to rip out the L3 agent software entirely. We threw hardware ASAs in front of it, um, set up those same IP addresses one-to-one -one NAT, and then had to like bridge that in. So we had to create, recreate their HA proxy instances 
with a with a second interface. So you had basically the direct coming in, but it was coming in the IP was hosted on an ASA. So that was a lot of fun, and uh, at least four weekends of my wife being very unhappy with me. So. <laughs> All right, that's 40 minutes. Thank you, everybody.